great to be here in this wonderful arena. You'll see from this that uh, my talk is indeed on evolution. Evolution as a word is loaded. Some people like it, some people dislike it. It has a long history, um, going back thousands of years, lots of conflict uh, around the word evolution. Darwin, Charles Darwin, when he came up with the theory of evolution by natural selection, blew away all the previous thinking about evolution, which until that point had been hierarchical, things being better than others, and came up with a way of explaining the complexity and the beauty that we see around us through the process of natural selection. Darwin's theory has been criticized by lots of people, and I'll deal with some of that criticism here. One of those criticisms is, how can a random process like evolution, because evolution is a random process of mutations, changing the DNA, um, thereby uh, creating variation. How can those mutations, which are random, come together to give us the complexity that is, for example, a human? And I hope to explain to you how that's possible. The first slide here you can see is the word evolution, and the blue numbers are random number generators. And they are live, and they are trying to match the code for the word evolution, which is in black underneath. And every time, each time it iterates, all the letters change, and you'll see if it matches it, a red letter comes up. It will only stop if all the letters go in one go, if it gets all of them in one generation, effectively. And you can see it's run now, while I've been talking, for 20,000 generations, and it haven't got all nine letters in one go yet. So it seems that random processes cannot generate complexity. Okay, and I'll deal with some of these issues and hopefully unpick that as we go through the rest of the talk. So now I'll move on to the main part of my talk. I'm going to focus on humans, perfectly created by a creative process or randomly complex by a random process. Or as uh, if you were thinking about hierarchy, four legs good, two legs better, as George Orwell would have said. Now, some of you may be biologists, some of you may not be, but when we're thinking about evolution, we don't start with a blank sheet of paper. This is an advert from a Sunday magazine or something for a toothbrush, and it just illustrates the fact that ideas of evolution are all around us, and misconceptions about evolution are all around us. It, we absorb them by osmosis. They're, they're out there in society, even though we might or might not have thought about these ideas. Here, there's some, some concepts about each stage being better than others. There are also concepts in there about complexity being better. The more complicated you are, the better you are. And there are also some inferences about direction, that whatever happens, there is an inevitability about the large, complicated toothbrush, the better toothbrush, ending up at the top of the tree. And most of those concepts are wrong and based on the old hierarchical system that Darwin uh, dared to change. Here's another advert that illustrates the same point, and in some ways is more striking. Here, the word evolution is actually being used in a positive way, okay? because they're trying to sell you a washing machine. So they're not trying to sell you a chimp, as far as I'm aware. Um, and the, so the word here is, is, is being seen as positive, as progress, that idea of progression and direction. But it, there are two things missing off this. I mean, it's saying that this washing machine has evolved, it's better, it's more complicated. So also saying something about the chimp, and the two things that I think are missing off here are, in a hierarchical sense, being better as the, the new washing machine is, there's your old washing machine, and the new washing machine has evolved, it's better than that, it's more complicated, it's, it's up this hierarchy. But the shocking thing to parallel that, I think, from a biologist's perspective, is that the chimp actually um, should also have a human to match it in terms of the washing machine. So to parallel that, what it's saying is that in the same way that the new washing machine is better than the old one, which it evolved from, humans are better than chimps, which they evolved from. And of course, both of those concepts are wrong. Humans did not evolve from chimps. Humans and chimps had a common ancestor. And humans, as we'll see, are not better than chimps. They're just different. So neither is perfect. This is, in fact, what Darwin provides the great insight 
to organize life not in a hierarchy, as we've been doing since the ancient Greeks, but in a tree where all living organisms are equally good, equally fit, and at the end of those branches, alive, and a common ancestor at the base of those branches um, from which they evolve. So Brad Pitt is equal to a chimp or even a slug or a lettuce. Okay? They're all equal at the end of those branches and they're all equally successful. And this is the model that Darwin gives us. So how do we then in this, in this context deal with complexity? Well, before Darwin, complexity was seen as being designed. This is a book, the cover of a book by William Paley called Natural Theology, and it's the last really in a long line of natural theologians, including Newton and John Ray and people like that, who viewed, who viewed the world, viewed creation, in order to come to understand the creator better, since he'd created it. And they explained complexity as design and used it to justify the existence of a creator. So the for a classic example would be if you look at a watch, if you take the back off a watch, you see a mechanism, you see that it works in order to tell the time accurately, um, that there are checks and balances in there, and you'd say this watch has been designed. There must be a designer, that designer is the watchmaker. And then looking at the natural world, you look at an eye, it's complicated. It's got bits that work together that have to be coherent in order to form an image on the back of the retina. So that complexity implies a designer. That designer then is the creator. So a design um, explanation of, of complexity. Now Darwin took that book on the Beagle when he sailed off around the world for five years. So when Darwin went, Darwin was, in fact, happy with natural theology. But during that time and subsequently, as you can see from this simple analysis of the occurrence of the word design in the two books, The Origin of Species and Natural Theology, you can see that Darwin only mentions design once. And when he does, it's to criticise the idea of design as being some explanatory power of complexity, whereas in the uh, natural theology book, there are 145 mentions about how things are designed. So, what are the issues about complexity currently? What are the debates at the moment? Well, they still exist. The idea of things being designed and being complex has been argued, is being argued, to be irreducibly complex. And what this means is that if something is complicated and you, so complicated in its function that if you take one piece of it away, it doesn't work anymore, it's irreducibly complex. And if, if that's the case, if you take one piece of it away and it doesn't work, it can't have evolved or been designed or put together by the gradual process of evolution. And the natural theologians, uh, sorry, the, irreduce, the people who talk about irreducible complexity stop at that point. But the inference is that there is a creator who's done that. It's essentially a creationist argument. The thing that they use currently or has been used as an example of this is the mousetrap. A mousetrap is designed, clearly, to catch mice. And it has a number of intricate pieces that have to work together in order to catch the mouse. And if any of those don't work, you don't catch the mouse. It is irreducibly complex. However, that argument misses two important points. Firstly, it doesn't have to be perfect to work. There are bits you can take away, and it still works as a mousetrap. And in fact, in the long term, not to keep mice out of your kitchen, but in an evolutionary perspective, damaging a mouse by 1% is actually valuable in, in evolution. So an imperfect mousetrap still works in an evolutionary context. And you might think about that in terms of the eye. Okay, a fully formed eye forms an image, uh, which is a 3D color image in the case of, of humans. But in the case of um, 
some fish or other organisms, they only have light sensitive cells. They haven't, the, the, the evolution hasn't given them a fully formed eye. But the ability to tell the difference between light and dark is better than the ability to be totally blind, to be able to see if it's night or day. So an imperfect adaptation is useful, has an advantage. Think back to the toothbrush series. Being able to clean your teeth with a, a finger is good. Being able to use a stick is better, but it's not perfect. And the second reason is that it might not have originally, in biological terms, been developing to be, or because there's no direction in evolution, to, to be the mousetrap. It might have evolved from something else. It might have been pulled together, as a, cobbled together as a, a bit of uh, uh, a biology uh, that did something else. And the bacterial flagellum is an example of this. It's the little propeller, very complicated organ that propels bacteria through fluids. Originally, molecular biology now tells us it wasn't a flagellum at all. It evolved as a secretory organ. So a mousetrap, for example, could have done something else. Could have been a tie clip or something to keep your sandwiches, sandwich bags closed. So things don't necessarily look like they've evolved along the trajectory which is supposed. So moving back then to, to Darwin, here he is being equal to a chimp. This is the two pound coin from 2009. Are we better than chimps in our complexity? So there's the tree again, and of course that's the environment in which chimps live. Okay, chimps are quite happy uh, running around, climbing in an arboreal environment where they um, have to avoid branches, so they, they mainly walk quadrupedally. They're not very good at walking upright, bipedally. Whereas humans walk in more open spaces and are bipedal. So does that make us better than chimps? Are we higher up the, the ladder than chimps, or are we equal on the tree? Well, our bipedal locomotion, which evolved after we split off with the common ancestor between humans and chimps, has certain advantages in, in the environment to which we were, uh, were, were living, more savannah, broken up forest type environments. However, it's not perfect. There are costs to those adaptations. A lot of them pertain to the heart, some of them don't. But for example, by standing upright from a quadrupedal uh, original stance, you have to put a kink in the back of your spine, okay? So bad backs. It's not a good design if you use design in an advised sense. In this, If it was designed, you wouldn't design it like that. Other adaptations that we have, other problems that we have, mainly center around the heart. If you stand upright, you're about a meter further off the ground. For every meter further off the ground your heart is, it has to pump a tenth of an atmosphere, uh, atmosphere harder, so more pressure is required to move the blood around your body. So we have problems like heart disease, a common. Um, those, well, hopefully you're younger than me, but uh, varicose veins. Pressure needed to get the blood back is too low because the heart requires higher pressures. And of course, if all your weight now goes on two feet instead of four, things like flat feet may become a problem. So while we are adapted, we're not perfectly adapted, and neither are we perfect. Neither is the chimp, but we're adapted to our own environment. So we may be complicated, but we're not perfect. So let's go back to the original thing that's still running. Over 100,000 generations, and this still hasn't managed to generate the complexity by this random process. Where does this complexity come from? Okay, so if we, if we now think about it, that's just random process, but Natural selection, the clues in the name. If we switch to the same engine, the same random number generator, but now we think like with the eye, a few light sensitive cells is better than a perfectly formed eye. If you're doing a crossword puzzle, having a few letters is better than no letters. It's not as good as having all the letters, but it's better than having no letters. If we now tell the same program, what I'd like you to do is Okay, if you, get the, if you get the letter E, that's better than not having the letter E, so we fix that. It's like a few light-sensitive cells, not the whole eye, with the analogy being the whole world of evolution. And you can see each time this is done now with the same random process that didn't find evolution, the complexity in 100,000 generations. The same random process does it, in this case, 35 generations. I didn't see what the previous one was. 
but um, it can be 70. It's always different because the randomness is always random, but the selection is not. And that's the crucial thing. That complexity is true. That if a hurricane blows through a scrapyard, random processes would not give you a, a 747 jet. Okay, random processes, have you seen with the first iteration of that, do not give you a complex um, organism. Evolution doesn't work like that. But evolution is a random process coupled with a non-random process, that of natural selection or differential survival. Okay? And that is not random. So if you have a mutation that gives you a woolly coat and the environment is colder, you are more likely to survive than somebody who randomly did not get that mutation. So I think it's well summed up by Richard Dawkins, who said that life, evolution, biodiversity, human complexity, whatever you want, is the product of the random survival, of, of the non-random survival of randomly varying replicators. Thank you very much. <laughs>